What is a feast to a frontiersman? Is it as much buffalo as you can eat in a day? Is it the amount of supplies that you can carry on your back from the start? Or is it a fresh caught catfish from a stream? These men were in a situation where all their provisions might disappear with one false move. Today we're going to give these men a victory. We're going to have a feast. So who were the frontiersmen? This was a special time and place in history, and it took a special kind of person who was willing to go into this frontier and settle it because it was so amazingly dangerous and difficult. It didn't have all the wonderful things that you would find in a normal society. You couldn't go down the street and buy your supplies. You didn't have the kind of support that you would expect in a town. There was no constabulary. It was the Wild West. And so it took a special sort of man. The Scots-Irish coming out of the border region between England and Scotland, they were willing to live in this kind of a situation. This is a group of men who've come out of one area, they've come to North America, and they just don't belong. They don't belong in the society that is along the coast. They're naturally drawn to this area that is the frontier, that doesn't have the same sets of laws or even rules for conduct. In a sense, my whole life has been building up to this frontiersman experience. How can I understand the frontiersman? I bought this property and there was nothing here. It was bare land. I built the house. I built outbuildings. And then we started this homestead project, building the cabin and a forge and other little pieces here and there to try to understand exactly what a frontiersman's life would be like walking in his shoes. So where are they coming from and what do they hope to find? They're coming out of places like Philadelphia and Alexandria, Virginia and, and Charleston, South Carolina. And they're, they're looking for a place that fits their character and that they can find a new life. That life isn't there in the big city for them. There are two very, very common routes to get into this area that is the classic frontier through the Cumberland Gap or down the Ohio and up the Kentucky River. These are the routes where everybody's traveling. They make little settlements or stations along the way to support their travels. And they're looking for an uncivilized area where they can plant their roots, where they can find their American dream. So as we look back in history and we think about frontiersmen like a David Crockett or a Daniel Boone, we can glorify them. But they weren't glorified in the 18th century. Those civilized places along the East Coast, they didn't want to have anything to do with them. There's another misconception that these are rugged individuals going alone with nobody else with them. And in reality, they went in groups, teams of men half a dozen, a dozen, two dozen at a time, even family groups setting up. This wasn't a lone occupation. They were together. Today when we travel, it couldn't be easier. You can get on your phone, it'll tell you exactly where to go. We have these beautiful paved highways, sometimes four, six, eight lanes wide, and we can go as fast as we want. It was not like that in the time period. You're going by foot with a pack horse. You're having to cross raging rivers. You're having to go across ravines. You're following trails that you're not sure where they actually go, and you might have to back up and find the real trail. If that's not hard enough, a simple injury, a tiny snake bite, or a scratch can lead to your death. Colonel James Smith and Nicholas Cresswell both were injured as they were traveling. James Smith, he hurt his foot. He couldn't move for several weeks. In that time, every day, they were in danger of being attacked by Native Americans. Nicholas Cresswell, he hurt his foot. People had to bring him food. He couldn't travel where he needed to go. He had to stay at camp. Other people went out and hunted, and he couldn't do it. If you were going by canoe, that could be treacherous. It was very easy to overturn these canoes and you never knew what was gonna happen with the water. The waters might rise suddenly because of a rainstorm 200 miles away, or there might be no water in the river and you had to drag your canoe by hand over rocks. Wildlife was a danger also. 
In Cresswell's journal, he talks about a buffalo stampede at night that nearly crushes two men, and also bears and mountain lions. So what is a feast to a frontiersman? It's interesting that the frontiersman's normal meal is the polar opposite to the meal of the poor farmer on the coast. The poor farmer on the coast, what does he want? He wants meat. The frontiersman, what does he have? Nothing but meat. He's got deer, he's got turkey, he's got buffalo. If you kill a buffalo, you've got 500 pounds of meat. What do you do with it? It's gonna go bad in two days. You're gonna eat as much as you possibly can. But what do they really yearn for? They yearn for flour, for bread, for cornmeal, for hominy. That's what's hard to get for a frontiersman. So these special items, those are brought along from the coast or from supply areas. And multiple times, Cresswell talks about the difficulty of finding those kinds of supplies. He's in Pittsburgh, they wanna bring supplies and they were only able to get like five pounds of flour per person. That isn't gonna last very long on a trip. And so they have to ration that out. It's very easy for these supplies to go bad or to spoil. While Nicholas Cresswell was traveling, the buffalo stampede into the canoe, the flour gets wet and spoils half of their flour. And so they have to ration it just this tiny bit each day. It's something he wants so much to make his own bread, but he can't do it. He's got to use his flour in soup to make it stretch as far as possible. For this meal today, I've got meat. I've got both fresh buffalo and dried buffalo, something that they would do along the trail. Four or five days after killing a buffalo, that meat is going to go bad. It's going to spoil almost immediately, and so they dry it over a fire using a Native American technique. I've also got a little bit of flour, just a little bit left over from our rations. I've got a little bit of cornmeal and also some hominy. So we're gonna make a hominy stew with a little bit of dried beef, with some of the hominy and just a touch of flour to thicken it up. We have enough cornmeal to make an ash cake over the ashes. Life for the frontiersman was seemingly impossible. He had very few supplies. He was in a very dangerous situation. He had almost no support. But a meal like this at the end of the day would be a luxury. It would be everything he wanted. As much as he wanted, and if he had some of those special things that he yearned, he would think it was the best. This is the Poor Frontiersman's Feast, and it is very good.